Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to welcome you all here today for our discussion. Um, I'd like to say a big welcome to all our Social Democrat members here today for our annual conference in Dublin. And I would also like to say a special thank you, a special welcome um, to all the people who are joining us um, live on the RTE News Channel. My name is Councillor Elisa O'Donovan. I am a Social Democrat councillor in Limerick City West. I also work as a speech and language therapist in primary care in Limerick City also. Uh, the topic that we are discussing today is a topic that undoubtedly has touched everyone in this room and also everyone that is viewing at home also. And that is the cost of living crisis. The increasing cost of living is undoubtedly one of the single biggest issues impacting ordinary people and families in Ireland today. It impacts absolutely every aspect of our life from healthcare and childcare to just doing our weekly shop. Um, so I'm actually delighted today to be joined by four of our Social Democrat TDs. Um, I'm joined by Jennifer Whitmore, who is our party spokesperson on energy and climate. Um, Gary Gannon, TD, who um, represents us on education. Holly Kearns, who is going to be speaking today about disability. Um, and Kian O'Callaghan, um, a TD, who is our spokesperson on housing. So I would like to welcome all of them to this discussion Thank today. Um, Jennifer, I might start with you. I think that um, many of us got a shock when our household bills came in this year, and those are even set to increase more by 400 euro this year. Can you speak to us a little bit about the impact of energy and the energy crisis on the cost of living? Yeah, so as you were saying, Lisa, like it is an issue that each single person in this country is, is feeling in their pockets. They're seeing it in their, in their households, they're seeing it in their communities. We had CSO figures uh, released this week that said our inflation rates are now at 7.8%, which is the highest it's been in 38 years. And I'm just looking around this audience and actually probably most of you have never experienced inflation levels like it. Um, so I suppose it, it is really uh, making quite a big shock to, to within our communities. There's a few different drivers to it. So uh, the, the cost of inflation is really dealing with, say, things like, as you say, energy. So uh, home heating, uh, electricity, gas. We also have then transport costs because anyone who would drive here would know it's expensive to fill your car now um, and then there's you know food costs as well and housing costs and you know Keen can, can talk about the issues of housing but I suppose what's really interesting about the costs that are really driving this is most of us um, you can't you can't reduce a lot of these costs like they're non-discretionary items and so when we talk about the rising cost of inflation it doesn't hit everybody equally and we, we listened to Richard Richard was just fantastic earlier on doesn't hit everyone equally and there are some people who will not be able to, to actually um, make any inroads with these costs because they can't reduce the amount, you know, in many instances if you're in rural Ireland, you can't reduce the amount that you drive. You can't reduce your home heating in winter if, if you're sick or uh, if you've children, you just can't do it. And then food costs, we all have to eat. And what I'm finding, and I would imagine the other TDs are finding as well, is we're getting people into our constituency offices who are making decisions between um, do I pay my electricity bill or do I eat? And I, like I had a man in with me who he's diabetic, he's, he's um, you know, has cancer at the moment and he paid his electricity bill, which meant he didn't actually buy food and he ended up in hospital. Um, in, in, you know, um, because, because of that. So like these are the decisions that an awful lot of people in our country are facing at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that we've, we've been raising repeatedly uh, in the Dáil with, with the government um, because it is so important to communities across, across Ireland. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And I think that, you know, there are really genuine concerns, I think, in, in communities. Is that something that you say the rest of you have felt, you know, that people have come to you? And let's say, I know, um, Gary, um, you do a lot of work on education. We supposedly have a free education system. Um, 
what has been the impact of the kind of increasing cost of living, let's say, on, on education, particularly at primary, secondary level? Yeah, Lisa, so we have free at the point of entry education and then very much costs kick in, which send huge dark clouds for families, kind of. So we've entered June now, primary schools are just about to finish up, secondary schools are just about to finish up. In many ways, parents get to sit back and have a little bit of a breather. And then all of a sudden people start to think about September. And then the energy bills start to kick in, rental increases start to kick in. I don't have any children, but I hear they have this annoying habit of growing up. And <laughs> as they do, I mean, that means there's um, increases in uniform costs, increases in books. At primary school level, the cost of education is about €1,200 a month. At secondary, that's €1,500 a month. Now, if you're already squeezed to the bone there, I mean, those costs are one that's going to genuinely impact the way you sleep at night. So, I mean, one of the proposals that we have, and it's not a national amount, an astronomical amount of money, it's just f pure free education in this country. A cost of education shouldn't be a barrier to a parent sending their child to school. There should be no child going and wondering about how do you afford the uniform, how do you afford the books. I mean, these are things we can do. These are things we can get in front of. I mean, Keane's been great over the past couple of months in terms of highlighting the 450 million going to builders just to do their job supplement. Imagine if that was going to actually free education. Imagine the, the level of stress that would alleviate for a family. I think they're the type of measures that are social democratic in their essence, but they're also just fair. I mean, we're talking about the cost of living at the minute, but for many families out there, those um, the costs are just surviving, and that's what we need to be getting in front of. Absolutely. Um, you know, I absolutely think everything you're saying there is, is just completely correct. Like, what do you think? Like, if we did have a genuinely free education system, like... What difference would that make for families, do you think? Let's say in your own area, in, in Dublin Central. It's, but we can just put, it's the words we use, it's just peace of mind. Mm. Can you imagine there is, there is parents, there's mothers, there's fathers out there who are genuinely stressed about the idea of sending their kids to school back in September because of the increase that's going to cost in their household budget. People are choosing between their energy and their food costs. Jen captured that perfectly. People are also wondering, well, maybe your kids can skip that book that, this year. Like, that is genuinely a fear that's happening in people's households. Maybe that uniform that doesn't fit anymore, we might get another year out of it, even though it's going up the kid's calf at the minute. Like, that's actually happening there. So, so we're relatively prosperous. We are a prosperous country. One in six people here are living in poverty, though, are at risk of poverty. If we can alleviate that in a very basic thing like education, it makes a massive difference to families. But it's in how we choose to invest our money. Do we choose to give these 450 million surpluses to builders to do their job, or do we choose to invest in education, in our children's future? But not only our children's future, that kind of sounds kind of far off. Do we choose to invest in actually the peace of mind of a parent? Like that's, we can do that. Like that is not beyond the realms of possibility. That is not a mythical unicorn. That happens elsewhere. These are decisions that will be taken with a different political philosophy, different political ideology, and just a sense of we recognise people are struggling, so we're going to intervene. Intervention is the very basis of social democracy, and that's all we're talking about here in terms of simple primary education, not only free at the point of entry, but completely free. But that's that's it's just a minimum. We shouldn't accept anything less. It's ludicrous that we have until this point. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, in all our communities, we're just seeing that a real struggle, um, particularly for those on kind of lower middle incomes, you know, and it, it is, you know, it's something that's very difficult as a public representative, um, you know, when you're seeing those struggles and people are coming to you with those concerns. Um, and I know that one thing that you mentioned there was, um, Gary, is people being at risk of poverty. Um, and to see that in a prosperous, country, a prosperous con country is just, you know, it's really shocking and it's really unbelievable. Um, and I'm going to come to you, Holly, because um, I think when we are talking about poverty, um, I think one sector of society that I think is at most risk of poverty. We know that almost 40% of persons with di disabilities and disabled people are at risk of poverty. And I know that this is something that you're very, very passionate about. Um, can you speak to us a little bit about, um, I guess, how disabled people, people with disabilities um, are maybe disproportionately um, impacted by the cost of living crisis? Definitely, and I think just briefly before going into that, because you're right, something I'm very passionate about and do a lot of work on is two of the things that Jen, you touched, touched on and Gary as well, is like the, the cost of living food is one of those things that, you know, it, it's gone up for everybody. And that the proportion of your income 
that you spend on food, it's, it's much higher for people on social welfare payments, for people on, on disability payment. And Gary spoke about an absence of government intervention on these things because I think the rising cost of living can feel like something that's sort of spiralling out of control and that we don't have a kind of control of. We can't, you know, implement policies that will change that because, you know, the government keep referencing that. That's coming from all of these external factors that are completely out of our control. But just to focus in on food for one moment because that is something that impacts on everybody. So that has gone up significantly and we've all heard the figures of how much a pound of butter has gone up and all of these different things. More money is not going to the primary producer there. So more money is going to the retail giants, to the, 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 the big agri-industry. You know, it's not going to the primary producer. So the cost of production has gone up. We know that from primary producers, from people in uh, livestock and horticulture, and we see more and more people moving out of those sectors because they simply can't afford to produce it anymore. They're, the money, the added cost that we're paying is not going to them, it's going elsewhere. And that is an absence of good governance. There are laws that can be put in place to protect those primary producers and therefore us as consumers. And I think that really needs to be called out. And then so relevant to that, of course, like you said, is people who are most at risk of poverty are people on lower incomes. The, the, the percentage of their income already that they spend on just, for example, food, um, that will now increase. And we know that there's an added cost of having a disability of up to 12,500 per year. That figure was established before this rise in cost of living, so we can all presume that it has increased as much as inflation has. And there has been no kind of intervention or measure put in place to protect those people. We know that disgracefully Ireland has the, the worst employment rate for people with disabilities. Um, so yeah, we're a real laggard in any kind of progression in that sense. And then we're faced with a situation like this, and we can all see the very, very profound impact that it's having on people with disabilities. And you spoke about a man coming into your constituency mm. with general with diabetes. And what we're seeing now is oftentimes when there is somebody in the family with a profound disability, they have to, um, you know, often the mother, for the most part it is the mum, has to give up employment to, to spend time at home with parents and spoke to a family recently, the absence of the July provision, the summer programme. There are so many knock-on effects that people are taking unpaid leave um, for... Oh, I'm having some mic difficulties, so I will pass back over to you for a moment. Uh, Jennifer, I think maybe you just want to come in there? Yeah, yep. just uh, something that, that Holly is saying about uh, a, a lack of governance. And when you talk about the energy crisis, we do have an energy crisis and there are things that, you know, that are outside the remit of this government. You know, there are issues. However, the reason it's impacting us so much is because we have had years and years and governments and governments of poor government governance. We have not built a robust society. We can't deal with those external shocks. Similarly, we can't deal with external shocks when it comes to food production because we've allowed our food production to be overseas, which is unsustainable, costly, and it just doesn't make sense doesn't lead to strong rural communities. So the, the inflationary costs that we're seeing now, if our governments had their eye on inequalities and on strong uh, internal systems, we would be able to actually withstand those shocks a lot better than we can at the moment. And the reason we can't is because they failed. Absolutely. And I guess just to add on that, um, so I'd like, a lot of the time, governments say, oh, well, we just didn't see this coming, you know, we just didn't know, and then things spiral out of control. Could the government have acted sooner in relation to this? Well, I, last September, um, I was asked them to deal with the, with the rising energy costs. And I think it was December before they came out with the emergency measure. Uh, that was, the, you know, put, putting money into the electricity accounts. Um, the reason they said they... Ha it had to do that in such a non-targeted way because, you know, obviously Social Democrats wanted to see a much more targeted approach to this so that the people who were really suffering were the ones who got the support, but the government uh, gave, gave the universal measure. Um, the, the reason they said they had to do it in that way is because it had to be an emergency in December. And then it was still four months before it hit people's bank accounts, right? So it was, you know, you know, even last September, it was clear that there was an issue coming down the road. And I suppose when we look at all the different things we're talking about, it's like there's waves. Mm -hmm. And we know when the waves are going to happen. So the wave when it comes to you know, families trying to deal with back to school costs, that's really happening now. Yeah. Where's the government? Mm -hmm. You know, where are their measures? Where's the expanded school meals program for children who are going to suffer from food, you know, suffer from food poverty? Whereas, you know, so there's, there's a way of the energy costs, which will obviously come in again in, uh, you know, coming into winter. You know, so there are measures that the government should be proactive on and they're not. It's like they wait for the waves to crash on our communities and to see 
who, who, who's actually going to survive um, and then bring in measures after the fact, which, which isn't, you know, it's not acceptable. And this isn't the first year where people on fixed income, be it social welfare, pensions, for example, have been experiencing poverty, be that in energy or food. But yet we've only had a five euro increase in social welfare or pensions over the last three years. We've known for over a decade now that social welfare rates were set almost below the poverty line. We recognised during the pandemic that actually 205 euro wasn't enough for a person to live on when you're placed out of work because of the pandemic, mm -hmm. but yet we didn't see it placed place out of any other context. So there has been an ideological indifference to people experiencing hardship, be that through food, be that through energy, through that cost of living, through skills or otherwise. Absolutely. But there has just been an indifference about it. It's almost that like there's an acceptance that we live in a society that is just going to have some degree of inequality, and that's fine as long as it doesn't impact the Fine Gael Fine Fall voter. But that's long, we're long past that now. We can't just be, we're talking about it now because almost everybody is impacted by it. But we live in a society that has been unequal for a very long time. And it's getting in front of that. We've been calling for social welfare rates to be linked to the minimum essential standard of living for years now. And we've been laughed at, well, almost, almost laughed at. But it's a case of now we're, we're actually saying people are genuinely struggling to feed themselves. We shouldn't have waited this long. The ideological indifference cannot continue. So that's what we've been trying to be vociferous in the doll in terms of putting that real people are genuinely not only struggling with the cost of living, but struggling to survive. And I suppose that's their job, to keep, the, keep pushing that, keep hammering at home. Absolutely. Thanks. And just briefly on the disability, because we'll probably yeah. move on to other things shortly, like on, on how government could act. I think there is that saying that, show me your budget and I'll tell you your priorities. And on the issue of disability, the department's own capacity review said that they need an allocation of 350 million to meet the unmet needs of people with disabilities, and then they allocated about 60. So there was never an intention to actually address those issues. That is very clear. And Ireland is not a country that cannot afford to meet the unmet needs of people with disabilities. So could the government act? Absolutely. And I think one of the things that really highlights this and makes it just clear as day that it is not a priority is the fact that we were the last country to introduced the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities mm. and we still haven't ratified the optional protocol of that convention. That doesn't sound very exciting, but it would mean that people with disabilities would have a right to education, to live independently, to all of the things that they should have a right to, and that the state could be held to account. So it is no coincidence that we haven't ratified that optional <coughs> protocol, because of course there would be litigation after litigation after litigation. And so that is very much what the government could do, should have done 10 years ago, and we absolutely would do. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, yeah, very good point. Um, no, thanks for that, and a really excellent point. You know, we were extremely slow. I think we were the last country in the EU to actually ratify the, the UN Convention, and I think to do it without ratifying the optional protocol, um, you know, is really doing a disservice to um, the, the many people living with disabilities in Ireland. Um, Kian, I'm going to bring you in because we absolutely can't have a discussion on the cost of living in Ireland without talking about housing. Um, as a local councillor in Limerick City, I, I would say every day I get um, at least three um, heartbreaking, I would call, cases um, from people. Um, the situation that we have in Limerick City at the moment is we have absolutely no emergency accommodation left for people in the city. So people are forced, families, children, to actually live on the streets. Um, it is just a, a massive issue throughout the country, and I know you have been doing enormous work in, in relation um, to it. Um, I guess just to start off with a kind of specific question, because I, I, there is a motion um, that is being proposed um, at a conference this weekend, particularly in relation to dereliction and vacancy, which is, which is I think, a huge issue. I went for a little walk around uh, Dublin this morning, and it's something that you can see here. It's the same in Limerick City. It's, a, it's the same throughout the the country. Perhaps maybe you might just talk a little bit about um, that just to start off with, um, just kind of dereliction um, and, and vacant homes um, and how we can use that to help people through this cost of living crisis. Yeah, thanks, uh, Lisa. The, I mean, if you look, we're in the Gresham Hotel here uh, today, and if you go across the road here uh, in O'Connell Street, there's a site in O'Connell Street in the heart of Dublin city centre 
that is vacant and derelict for over 40 years, and that's on the, the main street in Ireland's capital city. And that shows you mm. how seriously or how unseriously uh, the you know, go various governments have taken vacancy and dereliction over the years. Uh, Jude, Sherry and Frank O'Connor, who are two housing activists in Cork City, they've done a survey of buildings in two kilometre radius of the city centre in Cork. They've found 700 derelict buildings within a two kilometre radius of Cork city centre. That's not counting uh, vacant buildings, which there's many more of that could be put into use. So in terms of housing and cost of living crisis and the, the pressures that people are, are under, and it's very important to remember the people facing rent increases or housing cost increases are facing all the other cost increases that we've talked about in terms of you know, energy, food, food prices, uh, education costs. So in terms of what could be done straight away, if we brought some of those vacant homes back into use, that would make a massive difference. There's at least 90,000 vacant homes across the country. And then on top of that, there's another 20,000 uh, vacant housing buildings. And on top of that, another 20,000 derelict commercial buildings. And then on top of that, more vacant commercial buildings. So there's actually a lot of existing buildings that could be put into use right now uh, for housing. And of course, if that was done, it would make housing more affordable for people it would actually bring prices down. So there are a lot of vested interests that don't want to see that happening. And we have to question why is it that the government for years have failed to introduce any sort of taxation uh, on vacancy. They keep on talking about it, but they haven't actually uh, done it. So why haven't they? And the last thing they've said in it is they've said, oh, well, we'll do a uh, survey through the local property tax returns to find out what level of vacancy is needed, or there is. Now, you don't need to do that survey. We have very good data from the CSO where uh, the enumerators call to every single uh, house in the country. We have very good data from the on-post geodirectory survey, uh, again from uh, people who work in the post service who call to every uh, home in the country. So you don't need to get more data before you, you act, that's just a, a, an excuse. So if we were looking to do something immediately to get homes back into use, bring in a tax on vacant homes uh, and then get serious about tackling dereliction, that obviously would help communities as well, would help deal with the, the blight of vacancy and dereliction uh, also. And then that would give us a bit of time then to build the social affordable cost rental homes that we need to give people uh, an option in terms of, especially if you look at renters at the moment, I mean, they've had rents have doubled in the last decade. Uh, and in the last year, rents have gone up on top, of, you know, on top of being already very expensive, another 11%. So people just can't afford uh, these kinds of increases. Their wages certainly aren't increasing by these sorts of, uh, these sorts of amounts either. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I guess government is saying that they're tackling sort of rent increases and things like that by rent pressure zones and things like that. Are those working? No, and un unfortunately, we had reports last week, for example, uh, of some residents in Tubercurry where they've been faced with uh, rent increases of 75%, which is just people can't possibly afford. They're outside of rent uh, pressure zones. And they, for example, are making the case, the residents there, they've been in touch with me, they're making the case that the way the rent pressure zone rules are created, that's unlikely that they will ever uh, fit into that category mm -hmm. of a rent pressure zone, despite the fact that they have very large rent increases, simply because from time to time there are, it's quite a small area, from time to time there is no, uh, there isn't sufficient data, if you like, for them to fall into that. So these rules are often created uh, and designed in a way that they don't protect everyone. Even where there is rent pressure zones, all the data shows that those uh, rent pressure zones are, are the, the rent in increase limits have been breached uh, time and again. So they aren't working. That's why, you know, having clear measures uh, like a ban on rent increases, uh, you know, for a number of years until we can get supply uh, up, that would actually be helpful. That is what is needed. And you have to look at how we compare to other European countries as well. This is not, what's happening here isn't, isn't normal. The most expensive place to rent in a capital city in the European Union now is in, in Dublin. Uh, and it would be great if we could say that wage levels were the, the highest in Dublin compared to other European Union capital cities, but that's not the, that's not the case. Uh, so this is because government haven't been acting uh, on this. And the, really, the, the big thing that's missing here uh, as a country is we don't have the thousands and thousands of affordable rental and affordable purchase homes that you have in other countries. We aren't doing that. Last year uh, in Ireland, despite all the promises that were made, there was no affordable purchase uh, homes at all delivered and there was just 65 uh, affordable or cost rental uh, uh, homes provided. And that's, you've got this massive need. Uh, so 
that's kind of what we need to be doing. There's really good models from other countries. There's actually good models from Ireland as well. Oculon, for example, a not-for-profit uh, housing uh, association. They're, they are building affordable homes, uh, three-bed, semi-detached affordable homes in North County Dublin, for example, at about 260,000 euro. They're showing it can be done. The problem is that's been done on a very small scale. We need to have lots of those schemes around the country. We need to be doing thousands of those uh, each year if we're going to meet demand. And instead, really, what the government has been doing is they've been prioritising, incentivising investment funds, built to rent, very expensive, high rent uh, accommodation that most people can't simply afford. In my constituency, uh, just recently, there was a person turned away from renting a built to rent apartment in one of these new uh, schemes, where, there, incidentally, there's a huge amount of vacancy. Uh, and you know, these investment funds are allowed to keep these uh, new homes vacant for as long as they want to achieve the rents that they want. A person with an income of €85,000 a year was refused uh, to be able to rent one of these uh, new build apartments and they were told that they didn't meet the financial criteria. Now, if people on incomes of €85,000 a year are being turned away and if that's been allowed to happen and that's what's been encouraged and incentivised by the government, the priorities are completely wrong. We need to shift away from that and focus on you know, affordable homes that people can genuinely uh, are genuinely within reach. Absolutely, yeah. Um, thanks for that, Kian. And um, I just think housing is it's just such an important issue at the moment. Um, so I'm just going to ask all of the TDs, because I know you're all really responsive in your own communities. Is this something that you are hearing and seeing in your own constituencies, um, you know, when you're on the ground? Is, is housing something that is... Or what would you say is, is the kind of the biggest issues that, that are kind of facing your constituents at the moment? Well, I think in mine, it's certainly affordability. Yeah. Um, we, we've actually, particularly in the north of Wicklow, there's been a lot of building, but none of it is affordable. And so what you're finding is that people whose family supports and work and if friends are in, you know, they're, they're all based in Wicklow, but yet these people are forced uh, into, you know, further south or into other counties. And a lot of the calls that we get into, into our constituency office are from people whose landlords are selling up and that they have families and they're being told, look, you have three months to find somewhere else to live and they just can't within the community. That means pulling their children out of school. You know, it's, it's their entire support network they're being taken from. And it's just very difficult as a public rep to say you can't help. Yeah. You know, it's very hard to do that. So I think that that's, you know, certainly, and, and you know, obviously in Wicklow we would have um, instances of homelessness as well and, and, and not enough social houses being built. Like, I think they're pretty standard issues across across the country. Um, but it is very, very difficult, especially, as Keen said, when you, when you know that there's so many vacant houses there. Absolutely. You know, they're sitting there empty. And I think one of the things as well, when we're talking about the vacancies, and I just want to mention this, is if we're truly going to look at measures to tackle the climate crisis we're in, mm. we have to look at actually using the houses that we have built already and not building more houses with all the associated carbon costs and transport costs and everything else. You know, so if the government was really, really set on dealing with this climate crisis, they would actually be looking at the vacant homes first as their first port of call, um, you know, and they're not, and I just don't understand why. I think Jen touched on something there that's also very extraordinarily difficult as a public rep. When somebody comes to you with a genuine need, and almost having to say, been incapable of helping. So one of the things I see in my constituency all the time, I have done for as long as I've been an elected rep, is people coming to me who are living in con conditions of extreme overcrowding. You're talking about living in a house, maybe a flat, an apartment, that might be two bedrooms. You're having three generations of the same family that live in there. And they're coming to me and I'm saying, are you on the list? And they are on the list. And they're, what, some 700, 800. And these are people who are not even captured in the homeless figures. But I promise you, the situation those people are living in is not a home. It's, it's a bed. It's an existence with their, fam with their kids. And you can't even, that's not even captured at the moment in the figures. And that's really difficult when somebody comes to you with that level of need and you're trying to, I mean, how can you even intervene on the behalf? We can't bring up the council and say, would you mind putting this person who's 700 on the list ahead of the person who's 699 ahead of them? And it's even that level of um, 
the need, the desperation, that's not even captured in their conversations at the minute around homelessness, around housing, around just the human rights implications of it. And that's one of the things that we're finding is really frustrating. It's even just trying to capture the need. We have homeless figures, but we don't have the figures of people who are genuinely just pure in need of a home. We have a, an overcrowded list on Dublin City Council, but that's the list everybody's on now. Um, so when people are coming to us, that we have a different sort of list. We have an exceptional needs or even a medical grounds list. And everybody will know who works either in an office of a TD or a councillor. You're trying to help people fit into those really crude criteria. So all of a sudden, public representatives are almost becoming out of absolutely just desperation of trying to help, trying to tell people how they might even fit into kind of a medical need or try what medical letters they might get. Like, I mean, that's the role that's completely undefined. It's never going to be captured. But it's something that's impacting people constantly. And so when you have that housing need, when you're, I, if you're living in a home with your grandparents, your mother, your uncles, their kids, your kids, I mean, the mental health implications of that, that level of actually just not feeling like your rights as a human are being met, they're massive and we don't have mental health supports for that. Then we have children going to school who haven't been able to... We, during the pandemic, we heard about a tech divide. We heard about children having access to technology, and other children not having access to technology. And that was very, very relevant. There was other divides. There was divides with children not having access to a table on which they could do their homework on, or place that laptop on. I mean, those kind of human rights um, consequences of our housing crisis are very rarely even touched upon and it's when you see them they're just so stark they're so lived and again it comes down to not only this cost of living issue but the cost of genuine survival and also the stall the the trauma the generational trauma that that's building up for future generations well nowhere in front of that how does a kid develop when they're living in an environment which seven eight or sometimes more are living in the same home they haven't got access to somewhere to do their homework. They don't have access to play, the right to play. Um, it's, these, are the, these are the ramifications of a crisis that we haven't even begun to become in front of yet. I suppose that's one of the things that we need to be screaming out constantly. It's not just a housing need, it's a human need. It's a need to how we develop as society. So, yeah, these are, it's multifaceted. It's when people are coming to me about, with the housing crisis or coming to our office, I'm very conscious the support that we can offer is almost limited because it's so multifaceted. And it's yeah. heartbreaking knowing that when you help oh, someone, yeah. that there's probably 10 or 20 or 30 other families in your area and who need that help as well. And you're so, you know, it's and this, so difficult. And at this client, this culture of even how do I help? Do I ask and yeah. they be put ahead in the list ahead of somebody else who probably has the exact same need? And that's not going to happen mm. either. It's just how can we actually get in front of this as kind of a human crisis? Mm. Like the trauma of it is uh, it's something that we haven't even began to experience. Yeah. I think yeah. you're no absolutely right and I think that like I'm really glad you brought in I guess those sort of other aspects of mm -hmm. housing such as overcrowding and, and things like that which are uh, really important. I know in my own constituency in Limerick City West um, we actually have a direct provision centre there mm -hmm. and um, I think it really highlighted particularly during Covid that that and you're, you're completely right about it being a human rights issue. Mm -hmm. It is completely unacceptable that people in 2022 20, in Ireland are living in direct provision centres um, and it is something that really needs to be kind of highlighted and, and addressed so I, I'm glad you brought in those mm. sort of other aspects of the housing crisis that perhaps aren't spoken about that much but, um, but, but, but need to be spoken yes. about and um, Holly I think you just want to come in there as well. Yeah and I suppose important to highlight with everything that Gary and Jen are saying there like it is a result of choices made by government, like Ian highlighted. It was good to remember that this isn't by chance or by accident. Mm. Um, and really important to flag, I think, the kind of issue of people all over the country getting in touch with their public representatives then about housing. And this is one of the problems with the Irish political system, is that then, you know, TDs and councillors as well kind of taking credit when somebody gets a house. But we have to zoom out and look at this as a system and say, do we think it's fair that... Gary gets a house before Jen because he knows a TD. Mm -hmm. That's not like, it's, it has to be based on need yeah. and this kind of issue of how, you know, because Irish politics is so good in a way that we're really close to our communities. We're on the ground. We don't all move to the capital after we get elected. We're really engaged in our, com our communities. And I think that's really helpful, a, a really kind of good thing about Irish politics. But with that comes this, I look after each individual yeah. person 
and oftentimes just claim credit for something you've nothing to do with because that's what you need to do to stay in a seat in Ireland. That really needs to be called out and highlighted because it happens so much with mm -hmm. housing yeah. and housing reps and all those things and ultimately and it shouldn't be making a difference. And disability, Holly. Yeah. So it just breaks my heart when I see children having to come to the doll and advocate for a new wheelchair. Or, and then they get it. And they get and then you but, but what about yeah. all those other families? Mm -hmm. Like it's great that they, but what about all the other families who don't know T D or can't get to the doll or don't have the energy, yeah. you exactly. know, the headspace mm -hmm. for that fight because they're so busy fighting for their child and their health care. Trying you to know, get through the day. Just we, trying to get yeah. through the day. We, and so. then yeah, and in relation to housing and disability, the grants at the moment are so unattainable for so many people. You know. There was a story recently in the Examiner where somebody had to get a loan of forty thousand, um, you know, borrow from, from the credit union, borrow money off a, a family member, and they had gotten the grant. <laughs> so you can imagine how many people can't ever make their homes more accessible. And of course, another thing that just flies in the face of the rights of people with disabilities under the convention is that, um, you know, at, at, at the moment, all of the people that you live with are analysed as your income as somebody with a disability. If you have the right to live independently, you could be living independently with other people whose income doesn't have a bearing on yours in terms of adapting your home. There's all of those things. And then I think like the, the, the issues are kind of different in different areas and certainly in West Cork and I think other rural areas, a lot of it is an absence, certainly in West Cork, an absence of availability. There's a lot of holiday homes. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, you know, the thing that people get in touch with us about the most is, you know, trying to get on the housing list, those kind of things. There isn't the homes there. and um, There isn't the homes to rent anymore. A lot of people move to rural areas during the pandemic, which is really great, but it has had a profound knock-on effect, effect on uh, availability of housing. And then the hoops that people have to jump through to try and get planning, there isn't availability to buy. And all the while, people are watching derelict buildings all around them in every single one of our towns and villages falling into disrepair. It's very difficult to watch. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's just a, a few more issues that I just kind of want to touch on because I think they're, they're really relevant um, in, in relation to this discussion. Um, and also, I, I think us being social democrats, we can't have a discussion and, and not mention slauncher care and health care. Um, we had a presentation earlier about um, inequality and um, one of the things mentioned during that presentation was um, health is the biggest social injustice um, in our societies. Um, we know that more unequal societies have um, lower life expectan uh, expectancy for middle and lower incomes, um, higher rates of emotional distress, mental illness. Um, we have a two-tier system um, currently in Ireland where people are paying for private health care, People are paying privately for private occupational therapists to get housing adaptations and um, all those sorts of things. Um, what do you think, as Social Democrats, um, are the solutions to addressing those health inequalities in your communities? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, slaughter care, we're very known for that. Um, it hasn't been implemented. Perhaps someone could speak a little bit to why the government are dragging their feet on slaughter care and, and what we need to do to address those desperate health inequalities in, in all our local communities. I think on that, I, with the, the frustrating thing about that is like, what's the solution? Well, here's one of those situations where we have a solution. Mm -hmm. Cross-party agreed policy for a national health service Every other country in Europe has it. I think for Irish people, we're so used to yeah. paying 60 euro to go to the GP. Yeah. We're all dealing with families every day who are paying privately for things like speech and language therapy because they can't get them on the public mm -hmm. system. So a national health service where care is free at the point of need and based on need, not on how deep your pockets are, it feels like a far-flung dream. Like, how could we ever possibly have that? But the reality is that every other European country has that and Ireland as a nation spends more per capita on our health service than all of those countries. So it really is a political choice. And of course, you know, like housing, you know, it's dogged by vested interests. Since its establishment, the health service has been dogged by vested interests in Ireland. And that is why we have a two-tiered health service, because some people very obviously make an awful amount of money through the provision of private health care. And that is literally why this is happening. And, you know, we had that cross-party agreement. <laughs> Um, 
And the, the reason that that committee on slum care was formed, and of course, co-leader of the Social Democrats, Roisin Shortall, was the chair of that committee and very much a, um, a strong architect of the entire policy. So it is something where we feel very strongly about it as a political party. It's a red line issue for us in government. It's incredibly frustrating to see mm -hmm. that, you know, that is in the programme for government for this government. But we've had several key members of the implementation body resign, uh, citing the lack of political will of this government to actually implement Slaunch Care. And, you know, one of the things that's so important to highlight is like the one of the key recommendations of Solange Care was that we needed that independent implementation body because of the institutional aversion to change within the department and within the HSC. Since those key members of the implementation body have resigned, now the government has tasked the heads of those two departments with the most institutional aversion to the change with the first um, part of this plan, which is the regionalisation aspect of it. A very important one, and as we can see, it's not happening. <laughs> and I think with that, like it is, it's such a missed opportunity. I mean, for the first time in the history of the state, there was cross-party agreement on what the vision, what we should have for our health system, you know, and I was so proud at the last election going around and yeah. saying, you know, that my co-leader, Ocean Shortall, <laughs> got this, she drove this, um, and she got this across the, across the line. And every government party use it as part of their promotion. Mm -hmm. You know, so they're happy to, to, to waive it, but they're not happy to implement it and put the money behind it. And it is such a lost opportunity. And I think we're, we're going to regret, and I think, you know, they'll regret not, not getting it across and, and implementing it when, when they had the chance. Yeah. Seems to be an, an absence of any sort of urgency towards the concept of public service mm. if it doesn't have any sort of immediate gain for the people in power. So when we talk about Slauncher Care, the idea was it was going to be a 10-year implementation plan, but for the rest of with Air Republic would have a publicly funded universal healthcare system, and that would be fantastic. During the pandemic, in the first months of the pandemic, we effectively had mm. a public healthcare system. It's very difficult to unsee that. But what then happened was an erosion of that. It was taken back the media considerations, power influencers were able to come in, dilute again the concept of Solange Care, and it was, seems it hasn't been taken, it's not taken off the table, but I mean, who's gonna, I don't see there's a, I don't see the urgency amongst those who are expected to implement that at the minute. And I don't think Solange Care will be delivered until we have a different government. I really don't. <laughs> and in case we needed yeah. any evidence yeah. that yeah. the National Maternity Hospital. Um, no, absolutely. Um, and um, I guess I think just to say, and I, I kind of want, there's, a, there's so many different topics to talk about, So, and I think this is also a really important one, and I think for me health is linked to the environment that we live in and the environment yeah. around us. And Jennifer, I know you've been, you know, you're the party spokesperson on, on climate. Um, you've been doing a lot of work um, in, in relation to our environment and, and making it better for future generations, making it better for us now. Um, I guess when we hear a lot about climate in, in the media, um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of talk around carbon budgets and, and all this sort of things. I guess, how can we address the climate and that also have a really kind of positive impact for ordinary people and um, let's say the, the, the people of your own constituency um, you know in relation to their own cost of living I think this is another really frustrating thing that mm. I find when it comes to the climate uh, that the messaging around it is that if we address our climate issues if we address our biodiversity issues it's so beneficial for everyone. You know, we, we would live in a society that has cleaner air, mm -hmm. where we're healthier. Um, we would live in warmer homes that are way more comfortable than they are now, much cheaper, it would cost us less money. We should be able to walk out our front door within five, 10 minutes, get a bus somewhere. We wouldn't need to be driving. You know, so the benefits are huge. And I think it's one of the things that, um, I found most frustrating over the last few years that the discussions about climate are really discussions nearly about austerity measures. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about how we can change how we live to make our communities better and our families better and our health better. And our, you know, it, it's more about what well, we're going to penalise or, you know, we want you to do something but it's going to cost you an awful lot of money. And then what that does then is that those people who can't actually who aren't going to be able to pay, who aren't going to be able to retrofit their homes or 
by electric vehicle, they start feeling very outside the conversation, you know, and they see climate and environmental sustainability as something that's sort of bad, um, and it shouldn't be, you know. So, really, what I, I, I'd really like to see much more sort of positive messaging about it, but a lot more supports for people um, that are going to need to make the changes that we need them to make, but that it shouldn't be their burden. It should be government's burden to help them with that. And, you know, I, we were talking earlier on about, you know, the inequalities and, and cost of living. And I think what a lot of people are finding at the moment with the rising costs is these are people who are working in many instances who've never, ever had to have support of any kind. And now they're seeing that they need support. Um, and certainly those people are not getting support when it comes to retrofitting. Yeah. You know, they're really not. I mean, have, expecting people to take a 50% loan out for 30 grand, who, who is going to do that? They're barely able to pay their rent or, you know, their mortgage costs, their childcare costs, food costs. They're just not going to be able to do it. So I think it's, it's the, you know, the ask from government is, is the wrong ask. I think the government should be supporting uh, those people um, to, to actually make those changes we need them yeah. to make. I've visited two places this year which had a high prevalence of young people, children and babies actually, with respiratory problems. The first is exactly where we're sitting right now in this minute, in the north inner city of Dublin, the highest level of respiratory issues amongst young people and actually older people in the whole country as a consequence of cars driving right into the sea where you are and the lack of any sort of alternatives, people even in overcrowded and damp conditions. And the second place I visited where people had a high level of respiratory problems was in the uh, Columbia, when visiting Colombia to the Sarahan mine where we've now started purchasing coal again as a consequence of the war in Ukraine. And actually seeing kind of issues linked and becomes, you can't help but see yourself as a global citizen. Um, the absence of any sort of retrofitting, the absence of any sort of transport alternative is destroying the health of people right here where we're sitting. But then the crude choices that we're making in terms of how we intervene is destroying the health of people on the global scale too. We've started purchasing, the Irish government has started purchasing mine, uh, coal to fund Money Point from the Sarahan mine in Colombia again. We stopped in 2018 as a consequence of human rights abuses being inflicted on the communities around there. And rather than actually stay true to our uh, climate action plans of 2030, which we've all agreed and signed up to, rather than see the fact that the horrific evasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation is a reason to change our mentality approach, we decided actually we're no longer going to deal with those people because of their inhumane treatment of one group of people. However, we're going to switch over and go over to another country where people are being impacted by the same decisions that we're making. That doesn't seem to be any urgency. We have a climate action plan that's linked to 2030. We're nowhere near meeting those targets. In fact, many of them are Back, many of the targets are backloaded until the next six years, so it seems the only real survival the government is interested in is their own, and they'll offset a lot of the problems for the next government mm -hmm. to come in. Um, so <laughs> But I, but I absolutely fundamentally believe to be a social democrat, to believe in somebody who does politics differently, as we all aspire to be in this room, we have to link these challenges of, on local scales, be that in here in the inner city for me, be it in your own constituencies, be it in the developing world and the global south. We have to be global thinkers in this. And we can't be, we can't be considering their kind of political choices. Doing politics differently now for us has to be about making changes that maybe we won't even benefit from as a party, but that we actually leave a better place for those that come after us. I think that's absolutely essential. Yeah. And there's just two more areas I just want to touch on. Um, and um, Holly, I might come to you as a fellow Munster gal. Um, <laughs> Um, because I think a, a big issue for, I guess, regional cities, Cork, um, rural communities, um, in which I represent myself as well, um, is access to, to, to public transport. Um, and that's actually having a huge knock-on effect for people. Um, I know someone um, who lives out in rural Limerick, got offered a job in, in Limerick City, and can't take up the job because they don't have access to a private car, um, and there is no bus service you know, into the city centre. 
Um, it's, it's a huge issue and I do think, and um, we often look at Dublin and we look at your Lewis and your, your <laughs> and I know there's massive issues with, with the, the public That's transport great. system in, in, in Dublin, but it is chronically poor and it, it, it really links to everything, do you know? Mm -hmm. um, is that is something that you have noticed yourself in, 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 in Cork, in Cork County? Um, and, and what needs to be done? What, yeah. do we, what do we need to do to address this? 100%. I think it ties into a lot that what Jen spoke about there as well, that then the narrative becomes that this is austerity. So mm -hmm. if you're living in a rural area and you hear about targeted measures um, to address the cost of living, and that is, you know, to reduce the cost of public transport, and then public transport is just literally not an option for you. Mm -hmm. You do feel, you know, left behind, and it creates this really kind of divisive... Uh, debate, I suppose you call it, about climate action. And that approach in itself is so problematic that, you know, there's a common goal here of reducing emissions because that also sets up a narrative that, like, people in rural areas have nothing at stake. But it's like, you know, it, it, the way that the, the government deals with it results in people almost feeling like they're against climate action. <laughs> But of course, you know, we see this a lot in relation to farming communities, maybe I'll touch on that later. Um, but ultimately, what we also hear a lot of is a write-off of public transport from rural areas, like, oh, maybe we'll focus on electric vehicles in those areas, you know, we'll focus on the cities now, and absolutely in terms of reducing our emissions quickly, focus on the more built-up areas, and that, you know, really does deal with the issues around air pollution as well. But, for example, I live in a very rural area, I grew up on a small farm, um, if you drive two minutes further, you hit sea, you know, it's a cul-de-sac, but like, there's very few houses around and a car goes past every 10-15 minutes. So it shouldn't seem so otherworldly or out of reach or not even a prospect that we might have public transport in all of these areas. Mm. It's not a huge country and if there was a bus every hour going down that road that I live on, that I grew up on, loads of us would avail of that instead of having to pay the very high cost of insurance, of tax, of upkeep for car, of tyres, of all of those things. So I don't think that we should just automatically write that off like people tend to do. It's a, there's a real lack of ambition and vision in relation to climate action in this country. And like Jennifer has highlighted and continues to highlight, that results in people having an aversion to something mm. that isn't really a choice. This is an absolute must. And what we're kind of left with now is either, will we leave it to the last minute when we're talking real austerity? Or will we be imaginative and ambitious and address this now and make it actually something that has a profoundly positive impact on all of our lives, rural yeah. and the rest of the country? And, and it is. Like, it is just, it's political will, right? So the, mm. the Connecting Ireland plan that, the, you know, the government came out with, which is really to, to increase rural transport, like, that was allocated five million in last year's budget. Five million for the entire country. <laughs> and then the same government allocates 450 million to developers to build apartments. You know, it just, so there is just a lack of political will there and the lack of vision. Um, and a lack of responsibility. Like the government should be more responsible with how it's spending its money. We need to invest in these public services and they're just not doing it. You know. um, so we've got about seven minutes left. So what I might do is, Kian, I might come to you first and just say, so, you know, we, we are, we know people are, are massively struggling, you know, and, and, and there is enormous hardship for, for all the people that we, we represent. Um, in, in all aspects of life, which we've we've heard about, um, what what are the solutions to this? Like, what would you say if there was one thing you could do tomorrow to to really um, deliver for the people that you represent and and try and alleviate that hardship in relation to the cost of living? What would that be? Well, uh, one thing on housing I do is I get the four hundred and fifty million euro that the government is giving to developers to build expensive apartments that mass vast majority of people will not be able to afford. They'll only, they'll only go to the people on the top fifteen percent of incomes. That's what the analysis shows. So take that four hundred and fifty million. Don't give it to the developers for expensive, unaffordable apartments, and build affordable homes with that instead. You could build with that sort of a subsidy. You could build between five thousand, ten thousand uh, affordable. Uh, purchase an affordable cost rental home. So that would be a much better way mm -hmm. of using those resources and that would give people real... <laughs> real space. Thanks. Perfect. Um, Holly, how, how about yourself? It's hard to pick. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of things I think that need to be done, but I suppose 
you know, more broadly, I think we need a different government. I think if people want something different, they have to start voting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I, I think the best example of that is probably um, something that we can all imagine and we could see the profound impact it would have on our lives is the implementation of Solange Care. That is a mm -hmm. fundamental socially democratic policy. And I know you wanted to just mention a little bit earlier about kind of food production and, and the sustainability of that. Maybe just maybe just speak a little bit to that. Yeah, and I will be very brief. And yeah. I suppose it's it's something we talk about housing, we talk about healthcare, and we talk about education. We see them very much as, you know, uh, uh, public uh, departments that you know we, we all have, you know, something to do with. And agriculture is never really seen in that way. And I think. Mm -hmm you know, how food is produced and, you know, the food that we consume, it, it matters to everybody, it matters to consumers and ultimately, you know, it ties in a lot to the discussion on climate that um, any kind of uh, action to, to, to address the climate crisis in terms of agriculture is seen as a cliff edge for rural communities. Um, and the result of that is essentially we have the communities who will be the most impacted by climate change being the most scared of climate action. and like healthcare, like housing, there's a reason for that. Some people do very well out of the current model financially, um, and it's not farmers. And that whole narrative makes the kind of presumption also that because we're farmers, we don't understand facts or science or um, all of those things. And I just think it's something I really wanted to highlight during this discussion. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Gary, we'll go to you. What, what, what's the one thing that you, you think should be implemented to address this? Okay, um, it's very difficult to do one thing, so mm. I'm going to start with one thread okay. that begins. <laughs> I'm going to start one thread that begins at childcare and invest in a publicly funded model of childcare um, that kind of helps mothers get back to work, helps people start a child, start life with dignity, bring that right through to primary, where primary becomes free. We invest in not only the education in terms of the book learning, but the emotional learning and the development of a child. Bring that into secondary school where we have, um, again, emotional supports. So Reimagine and leave insert that's not done just for the purpose of an exam and a job afterwards, but helps develop the character, the personality, the um, resilience of a young person, and then give the opportunity to go on, be that into a trade, be that into college, university. I think if we see that thread as kind of how we invest in a child mm -hmm. all the way up in the surroundings of them, like be that the mother, the family, and see that thread all the way up, I think we can have a fundamentally different style of republic. Mm -hmm. that, <laughs> Oh, and you never said we were only, we had to pick one. Okay, well, yeah. you, you, you can never, do a thread, like, you can do a thread. I won't do it's a okay. thread, as eloquently as Gary would be able to. I, I think when it comes to, I'm, I'm just going to put the climate hat on, and hmm. I think just in relation to retrofitting, I think hmm. a simple thing that the government could do, it's really achievable, um, would actually be to make sure that, uh, that people don't have to pay up front for, for retrofitting, that the government actually does the retrofitting for people and then as they save on their energy bills that gets paid off. So I think something like that is it's managed. <laughs> so it, it's it's manageable and it's it's simple and it's been social democrat policy for quite a while now and I you know I, I really hope the government actually listens to, to this conversation so uh, and takes that idea and runs with it because people are not going to be able to afford to do what we're asking of them. Yeah, so. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Um, so I guess that kind of brings us to the, the end of our discussion. Um, I would like to thank you all very much for your contributions. Uh, I think it was, a really, it was a really interesting discussion. And I think certainly for me, I guess going back to the people that I represent in, in Limerick City, you're giving me a lot of hope. Um, and I think we, we need a little bit of that at the moment. Um, I think, like, just to say, like, as someone, as our Social Democrat TDs in the Dáil, um, I think you do an outstanding job, um, and I would really like to thank you um, for all that you do. Um, the theme of our conference today, as everyone um, will know, um, is doing things differently. And I certainly think that you representing us in the Dáil do politics differently. And I think that is something that we have 
desperately needed in Ireland for, for many, many years. And I think it's just refreshing seeing um, that sort of style of politics, um, you know, brought um, into the door and, and brought into our national representation. So um, thanks so much for all your contributions today. Really, really appreciate it. And um, thanks very much, everyone, um, for, um, for being here today. And I would just like to say thank you for everyone that tuned in as well on the RTE News Channel. Thanks very much.